So, the Thursday review returns, and by request, by your vote, if you're one of my Locals members, this is the article in question, Decolonizing the Undergraduate Chemistry Curriculum, an account of how to start. It's Thursday night study review. Let's get started. So, uh, if you're a member of my locals, and you can see it scrolling down there at the bottom of the screen, if you are a member of my locals, uh, I will be putting up a more frequently poll to allow you to vote on which article you want to see. And of course, as a member of my locals, you get first dibs in suggesting articles you want there on the Thursday night review. And don't forget that at 8 p.m. Central Time following the conclusion of this video premiere on YouTube, there will be a live stream exclusively for my local supporters to talk on this article, answer any questions you might have, and, uh, you know, just in just in general, uh, shoot the shit a little bit. I apologize if I'm still having microphone issues. It is distinctly possible I'm still having microphone issues. I haven't hooked up the new one yet, so we will have to deal with that, but hopefully it will not be too much of an issue. So let's get started here. Um, this is in the Journal of Chemical Education, and it features uh, talking about teaching chemistry, so the abstract here. Discussions on decolonizing the curriculum are common in humanities and social sciences faculty. Him, wait a minute. Humanities and social sciences faculties, but still rare in the physical sciences. In this commentary, we describe the work we have conducted to begin decolonizing and diversifying our undergraduate chemistry cu curriculum. We also discuss what it means to decolonize chemistry and reflect on why it is an important thing to do. Finally, we discuss a number of different strategic approaches that could be followed to decolonize an undergraduate chemistry curriculum. So when I was reading this article, um, there were a few things that came to mind, and I'm not going to bring them all up right now, but I, I want to see if you can um, follow a thread that I, I'm going to have with this particular article. Um, <laughs> I, I think it'll probably become pretty obvious because there's a, a few times that it comes out. Um, and uh, the other thing I would point out is the, if you're a long time viewer of this channel, you know very well what science actually is. Science is a process by which one gets at the truth and answers questions. It is uh, not a whole bunch of other things. Um, there is science as a discipline and that is a different thing, but science is itself a process by which we answer questions and get at the truth in pursuit of the truth in particular. So that is the more important thing. So let us begin here. The Department of Chemistry at the University of York in the UK has gained an international has an international reputation, excuse me, as a pioneer for gender equality, having gained four prestigious Athena Swan Gold Awards since 2007. Great. Okay, great. Whatever. Um not really doesn't matter all that much unless you're putting in putting in the thing of you are you're great and what have you um anyway in early 2019 members of the department began work to decolonize its undergraduate curriculum in this commentary we share our thoughts on what it me can mean to decolonize a chemistry curriculum describe how we've begun this process and reflect on why this was an important thing to do we emphasize that in writing this commentary, we hope to start a more open dialogue on how best to decolonize chemistry and stimulate widespread activity within our academic community toward this goal. You know, this is an assumption that they're making. There's an assumption here that decolonization is a necessary thing. And there's a difference between the postmodern decolonization and getting getting rid of systems you find problematic simply because um, they might be uh, tied to Western Enlightenment values or what have you. Um, but that uh, is an assumption that it is needed. It is an assumption that decolonizing is a good thing. Um, not saying it is or it isn't. I'm just merely pointing out this is an assumption that they are making here. <clears throat> In the broadest sense, decolonization involves identifying colonial systems, structures, and relationships and working to challenge them. For the field of science, it suggests that one that we should question our understanding of science as something that solely grew solely from the discoveries of a series of famous Western individuals. Instead, we should re recognize that there are colonial roots 
in science that can arise from both commerce and imperialism. The aim of decolonizing the sciences is therefore to develop a more complete scientific perspective that includes global voices. They're entirely wrong that folks view science that way as being entirely Western. I certainly do not, and if you've been around on this channel long enough, you know I did early on in this channel's history a history of the scientific method, and the scientific method itself is decidedly not Western and not colonial entirely. It is very much, in all of its components, it has its origins in the ancient world, from Egypt to Greece to Persia and Babylon to India and China, and probably many other places around the world that we just haven't figured it out from the archaeology part of it yet. So, you know, I'm sorry, that doesn't bite to me that you're thinking the scientific method is purely a Western and white thing that has its roots in colonialism in here. And admittedly, I will take a point here, they are talking about science itself. But, as I said, science is a process by which one gets at the truth and answers questions. It is not merely a discipline in and of itself. Um... And to say that it is only a discipline is very short-sighted and ignores the fact that the scientific process has its roots in the ancient world well beyond what we know to be Western, um, to be Western and uh, European. So I call that inaccurate, that people... Um, people do that there because, you know, it's never... Well... It may depend a little bit on the field. Like, in, in my case, in my own field, there's a number of scientists from across the world, um, not not all, not all white and Western, who featured very prominently in the history of climate science, as it is. Um, so, again, I would point out that's not entirely white and Western and should not be considered so. Um, but that is interesting here that they go with that. Again, uh, I'm noticing the assumption that it is good here. And, of course, the negative here in the framing is that, well... Science is a mess because, you know, it is supposedly all about Western individuals and when it's not. Now, I'm going to say right up the front, I don't have a problem with teaching the full history of science. And I think it is a dramatic failure of, of many different um, education programs, uh, not education programs, but many different curricula um, and K through 12 and what have you to actually do, to, to actually not teach that. I do think it needs to be taught, if only because you would actually have a very, uh, you, would, you would not have this nonsense of calling science colonial um, here and having science have colonial and Western roots. And no, 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 I'm sorry, it does not. Science as a process, science as a discipline, does not have Western roots entirely. It has very much global roots when you go all the way back to the ancient world where the most key component principles of the scientific method and scientific inquiry come from. Be it from, be it from, uh, be it from Arabia or be it, well, not Arabia, I'm sorry, Persia and Babylon or be it from, be it from Egypt, be it from Greece, be it from India or China, uh, that's very global in its nature. And as I've said many times, science is a global human enterprise, has been, will be, um, for as long as for as long as it's around. But it is a process by which one gets at the truth. It is not solely a Western thing. It is not solely a colonial thing. Um, in here, though, there are certainly many famous individuals from across the world who are involved. And where I would wonder would be relevant in the curriculum would be, you know, okay, how, how do I put this? Here's a question. How will decolonizing, their words, help the student's mastery of the material? Mastery of the basics of chemistry, if you're in um, undergraduate. How will it help with that? How will it make it better? How will it make it worse? The, this is an interesting thing. There's a great assumption here made that this is good, that this will be good. So define what you mean by good, right? Um, and that's kind of what I'm missing with this. This is... No, 
This is not purely a historic exercise, however. Although formal colonial structures have largely been consigned to history, there remains very significant inequality on the global scale, some of it structurally embedded as a result of colonization. The problems and concerns of wealthier nations are often very different from those of the developing world, as, the resources av- as are the resources available to solve them. Funding disparities mean that scientists and politicians in wealthier nations predominantly make decisions about which societal problems should be addressed and control the scientific narrative. This can leave significant parts of the globe disenfranchised in terms of access to science in order to solve its problems. Okay. Is the purpose of science to solve society's problems? We've talked about this before, and I've already hinted at it a couple of times. The, the, what science is, is a process by which one gets at the truth and answers questions that can be related to solving the problems of society. It is not necessarily always the case. For, exa- for example, the, uh, the, um, the mask fit, the mask hack um, study from a couple of weeks ago that I reviewed in brief where they tried to demonstrate that pantyhose will make your mask fit better. Well, I'm sorry, that doesn't solve a societal problem. <laughs> and it's not a very significant question either. Um, but you do have those kinds of studies. So, no, it's not necessarily so that you're solving societal problems and I wouldn't and it, one could perhaps argue that perhaps it's not the purpose of science to solve a societal problem it is the purpose of science to pursue the truth and sometimes that doesn't always line up with a societal problem um, regardless of whether you're in a rich nation or poor nation um, and so that's that's a bit of a misnomer I would call it um, but yeah, it's a bit of a misnomer. And yeah, you can use science to help solve societal problems, but that is not the purpose of science. The purpose of science is the pursuit of the truth. Um, and what scientific narrative? What do you what, what do you mean by scientific narrative? Uh, in terms of what the solution to a pro- what the solution to a societal problem is, if I'm going with I'm, if I'm going with the context that's here presented then the scientific narrative is supposedly then surrounding what the solution to a problem is and whether or not there is a problem. Um, That is doubtful that a nation can control the societal problem, that uh, that, that, that there is such a thing as a scientific narrative. And again, what narrative are you talking about? Because the purpose of science and the scientific process and scientific method is the pursuit of the truth. It is not not in the slightest societal problems and certainly not societal narratives. We, what did we have? We just had recently this whole thing on integrity, um, on preserving science, preserving and protecting scientific integrity. That was the white house office of science and technology policy that, um, that is starting to draft that. Um, and one of the things they harped on partly to their credit was, you know, wait a second, we got to make sure there's not, political influences in scientific practice and in science to maintain scientific integrity. So it would seem to me there's a something of a contradiction here. Admittedly, this is the UK, so they may see they may feel differently, who knows? Um, but I would hope, you know, it's yeah, I would I would hope there's more interest in pursuing the truth than whatever specific societal narrative. Now, that's not to say, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to belittle anybody in another nation or anything like that. That is not to say there's not problems. There's not to say that science can't be used to solve those problems. And indeed, I would like to see many different many different uh, nations get assistance with the problems that they have and have access to the scientists they need to help sol- uh, not to solve the problems, to pursue the answers to the questions around those problems and then make recommendations on what the society should do Uh, and those are two different things i'm just merely saying here that doesn't i'm so i'm actually i'm actually very much for let me make this perfectly clear i am very much for science being used to solve being used to address the questions relevant to the societies that they're in what i am not for and what i'm what i'm saying here is that the purpose of science is not necessarily solving societal problems those are two different things Absolutely, 
Science should be used to answer questions of relevance to all nations, and different nations should be able to have access to the sciences they need. That I don't have any problems with. And many scientists, if they can get the, get the funding to do it, will do work outside their own countries of interest. So there's lots of scientists I know in the U.S. who will do who who do research for countries in other parts of the world that are that are a fair bit poor. So that is a totally understood kind of thing. So no, 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 no. My thing is, I don't think the purpose of science is to solve societal problems as much as it is, as it is to find the truth. Everybody deserves access to the truth, which is why everybody deserves access to scientific practice and scientists. Does that make sense? For a practicing science department, it was important for us from the outset to recognize that decolonization should not just be a, about consideration of the curriculum itself and aspects such as the inclusion of academic work from global cultures in our academic coursework. Think We should think more generally about how we teach and assess, and it should allow for the possibility of a culture shift that provides a space for different views and ways of studying. No one studies the same way. Known a lot of students, none of them study exactly the same way. Um, and that's simply because they're individuals with their own habits of studying, um, not necessarily just whatever what, what culture they grew up in. Um, and there's two different things there. But I also wonder something. What do you mean by thinking about how we assess? Because there is discussion, you know, does this mean you're changing the standards um, and shifting away from a single metric, single group of metrics that against which we can me measure the success of all students and therefore measure their mastery and understanding of the material um, here? Because that would be what has been large concerns there is that you are insisting on getting rid of standards and dumbing down the curriculum. There's pro plenty of problems with standardized testing, but when you get rid of the standard altogether, or you're going for getting rid of the standard altogether, you're not improving the mastery of the students. You're just getting rid of the way to measure whether or not students have mastered the material. While acknowledging this broader educational aspiration, we focus, hang on next page, we focus here on describing our initial work, which is aimed at starting to decolonize our curriculum. Again, not shown anything about why uh, decolonization is a good thing. Oh, why did we decide to start decolonizing our chemistry curriculum? Okay, let's let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> why did we decide to do this? The project began at the outset because a group of our undergraduate students asked us to think about the the undergrad uh, decolonizing the curriculum. Yeah, to think about it. Um, following our initial discussions, the message from our students was clear. Decolonizing the curriculum was something that we should be doing and something that they strongly wanted us to do. Um, again, you're not showing me showing why this is good. Um, and I'm sorry. And, and I'm sorry. As much as the students may have wanted you to do it, the question of whether or not it is good is actually a much more relevant question in the implementation and how do you measure not whether it is good metrics you know evolve involving whether or not implementing something improves the mastery students have of the material that is actually more important than than just saying the students really want us to do this um not to say that should be discounted that should be included as part of the discussion but i have yet to see the authors of this point out why this is a good thing to do whether or not it improves mastery Let's see. We also were motivated to embark on this work by the growing body of evidence that's, that reflects the fact that not all students have are having equivalent higher educational experiences. You know, what I would say to that is students don't have... Why? why okay. Students not having equivalent higher educational experiences. Yeah. In part because they're individuals. They're, they're unique individuals with their own abilities and beliefs and talents and work ethics and a whole bunch of other things. So inherently, I would presume they're not all going to have an equal higher educational experience. You can't really get that if you have the diversity that is amongst individuals. At least I would presume that. Uh, in the UK, there's a 16.1% attainment gap between the number of high quality degrees, first or two to one, awarded to white UK domicile students compared to UK domiciled students from ethnic minority groups, that it is a disparity. Um, and the assumption here that they are making is that a disparity is equal to discrimination. And this is a logical fallacy called the disparity fallacy. Actually, just, it, just because there is disparity does not mean discrimination is the reason. 
um, or in this case colonization, from what they say here. That does not mean that. So that's a um, logical fallacy from my standpoint when I'm looking at that. <clears throat> Let's see. Do, 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 do. Royal Society chemistry studies showing that the proportion of chemistry students from minoritized ethnic groups falls from 26% at the undergraduate level to 14% at the postgraduate level. Again, that's a disparity. That's a disparity that I agree is very real. You are not showing me why this disparity exists um, amongst the population there. Beyond ethnic minorities, problems persist for other underrepresented groups in chemistry, including, for example, women and trans individuals. We note that similar problems are acknowledged to exist in the United States. Disparities? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We strongly believe, uh, as I said, disparities do not equal discrimination. Um, because that, that is absolutely a logical fallacy. That is a logical fallacy to say, because there's a disparity, discrimination happens. No, there's pl plenty of other reasons why that might be. Um, I'm not saying that discrimination doesn't happen. I'm not saying that. I'm merely saying you cannot say it is solely discrimination at this point. Uh, we strong, yeah, like I said, yeah, it's the logical disparity fallacy. It's the disparity fallacy. We talked about it before. We strongly believe that our courses should not disadvantage any student because of their background or characteristics, and we should have an ongoing commitment to ensuring that all of our students have equal opportunities to thrive. Yeah, that is a statement that, generally speaking, I agree with. I agree with. Doesn't mean everything, every student's going to succeed because not every student has the talent and the work ethic to go with it. Um, not, and, this, and also, you know, quality of the teaching sometimes is not also a good thing. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Universities UK published a key report in 2019 on closing the campus, uh, closing the attainment gap. The report made a strong case that campuses need to become, quote, racially diverse and inclusive environments if students from ethnic minorities are to succeed academically. Um... Yeah. When students from these ethnic groups were surveyed for the review, they re reported that they did not feel a sense of belonging at a university. Well, that's a lot of times when I don't feel like I belong at a university, but that's actually, that's, that's for some interest. That's for the, uh, the campus free speech argument is the problem that I have. Taken together, the views of our students and the broader recognition that decolonization, decolonizing the curriculum could play a role in addressing racial inequalities in university education provided a compelling impetus to begin the project. Did you catch the word that's there? There's a key word here. The broader recognition that decolonizing the curriculum could play a role in addressing racial inequalities in university education, which is to say they have no evidence this will work. They have no evidence this will do what they think it will do in terms of making people feel well, more welcome. You have no evidence of that. You also have no evidence of the other thing that actually does matter quite significantly, whether or not this will improve students' mastery of the material. And so that's uh, something I would point out, is that it does not seem to really, um, really make, a, make that case. It really provides no evidence that this is going to be good in any way, shape, or form. No empirical evidence of that in this is presented, to my knowledge. Um, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge. Let's see. First formal step of our decolonizing project was to form a steering group. This is, ju this is just an observation, having been in academia so many times. When in, for, for, having, not so many times, having been in academia for quite a number of years now. Um, yeah, when in doubt, make a subcommittee. <laughs> Make a steering group, make a subcommittee for something, you know, it's just need more, need more bureaucratic stuff going on, right? Mm. <sighs> Certainly makes for interesting things that way. Let's see. At its first session, terms of reference for the group were agreed to, and initial discussion took place around what decolonizing could mean for our department. Um, again, are they talking about if it's good? Are they just all assuming it's good? And everybody in there was interested in decolonization um, in that steering group. So are you saying it's good? Where is, where is, 
the justification that this is good. Like I said before, you already admitted, the authors already admitted, could play a role. They have absolutely no evidence that this is a good thing and will produce good results for the college. <clears throat> it was agreed that the first action of the group should be to communicate with the department about decolonizing chemistry and explain why we believe that this was an important action for the department to undertake. You know, you haven't mentioned it at all in this article yet. Um, you've told me pretty much that it was your the impetus uh, was your students and some disparities that you've noticed and the idea that maybe this somehow will fix the disparities. But there's no evidence that it does. So in other words, you haven't actually shown me at all in this article why this is why this uh, decolonizing thing is good that you had to do it in your own department. Let's see. Communication is essential at the outset of decolonizing project, although decolonizing is commonly discussed in EDI. I would prefer to say DIE or DIE um, at some points, but anyway, equality, diversity, and inclusion arenas. Knowledge of it among science academics is likely to be sparse and potentially controversial. There is belief among some scientists that decolonizing STEM would involve removing the teaching of well-established parts of science or somehow dumbing down the curriculum. Furthermore, some scientists feel that because science teaches objective truth and well-established discoveries and facts, it does not suffer from colonial influ influences and attitudes, and that such treatment is unnecessary. Science itself does not, because science is a process by which one goes after the truth. It is the people who practice science who actually implement that method, who suffers, suffer sometimes from the fallacies and what have you, and often under the principle of organized skepticism, those are sorted out into the refuse pile of history, um, as it were, such as the thing with eugenics and what have you, that got sorted into the refuse pile of history um, here, even though it was, even though it was result, it was some really bad science that was done, scientific work that was done, I should say. Um, here, it was ultimately sorted into the refuse file of file of pile of history because for a very good reason. It was garbage science. It was garbage research that was done. It should have been thrown out. Same for many other things that were based in a researcher's ideological beliefs and what have you. This is why we have the normative principle of disinterestedness, that when you are doing your research, you are dedicated to whatever the truth is, whatever the ev wherever the evidence takes you, not to whatever ideological thing is on your mind. Um, and that's why I... I'm looking at this like further, you notice how they quote objective truth and discoveries and facts. Science doesn't teach objective truth. Science practices objectivity when you're doing research. If you're doing it right, if you're doing the scientific process right, you are practicing the normative principle of disinterestedness on a regular basis and you are in pursuit of the truth with the evidence wherever the evidence takes you. When you, science doesn't teach that. That's fascinating. That's a fascinating, screwed up thing. Science doesn't teach objective truth. Science practices with objective truth. It is a fundamental part of doing scientific research and scientific practice that you're engaged with evidence, which way, whichever way the truth takes you. <clears throat> it's fascinating by itself. As to the dumbing down argument here, uh, yeah, there is concerns about that because of the push that has happened quite publicly in a number of places to get rid of standards for different things under the name of equity, and in some places under, well, under the name of equity, more or less. I was going to say under decolonization, but I don't know that for sure. And, you know, what I have to say to that is, well, yeah, that's why people are concerned about dumbing down the curriculum, is because you're talking about getting rid of standards by which you measure mastery. Um, and alongside that goes the idea of just dumbing down the curriculum, making it really easier, making it all about feelings, as it is in K-12. through um, here when it's truthfully, if you're practicing based on the evidence, it doesn't matter necessarily what a person's feelings are, um, here. You might, you might carefully phrase it just, just to get it across without being, you know, grossly offensive sometimes, but at the same time, if it's a true statement that you found based on the evidence that you have, not from being taught objective truth, because that's not what science does, um, I don't know where they get that from. That is not what science does. Um, science practices objectivity and disinterestedness if you were doing the scientific process right but it does not teach that um it often does not teach this is something i would love to see you know okay here's a deal i would take tomorrow 
teach an awful lot of science history, put in put in everybody everything and everything that you want, but also teach directly the philosophical side of science, the philosophy of science, which is to say, teach things like the normative principles of science and the principles of scientific inquiry, because those things are not taught in any college science curriculum that I know of. I could be wrong. Admittedly, I haven't looked through them all. At least they were not taught in mine, just to use myself as my anecdotal evidence. They did not teach those principles in any of my science courses in college. They did not teach them in any of the science courses I took in college. So that is a deal I would take tomorrow. We'll take the history course, but also include on top of that the proper understanding of scientific philosophy, the normative principles, the principles of scientific inquiry, where the, where the scientific method actually came from. Do that tomorrow. And that might be a deal that I would take. Um, okay, so let's see. There's the supposed things here. And again, science doesn't teach objective truths. It practices with it. It's a fundamental assumption. Uh, well, not a fundamental assumption. Science works with the truth, with evidence and with reality. And thinking about it, the correspondence theory of reality, too. Whereby, if it exists in the real world and it's connected with evidence, well, then that is something that is true and real. Um, <clears throat> that is a very crude way of saying it, but that's one thing to look at is the, the correspondence theory of reality. Despite EDI being well established and widely, ex we, we encountered such objections early in the project in our own department, despite EDI being well established and widely accepted. No. <laughs> I noticed you have no citation for that, for one thing, that statement. Um, so I'm going to say no. I don't buy that statement in the slightest as being accurate um, here because, at least in academia, it might be. I doubt it because there's significant there's quite possibly a significant number of academics and staff who don't like it and just won't speak up um and don't accept it and won't speak up as loudly as they could um and certainly right now in public purview it is not very well accepted <laughs> if you're looking at if you're looking at it in the public purview no i don't buy that statement in the slightest so i would i would love to be proven wrong so go ahead and find a citation and show me that as we will outline below, the view of science as objective and factual is a simplistic one, which fails to recognize the way in which science developed, the environment in which scientists work, and the societal context in which science continues to this day. Did I ignore that just now when I mentioned the fact that, oh yeah, the scientific process did sort out the refuse that was driven by ideologues masquerading as scientists? Like the folks who pushed eugenics or ultimately, or ultimately pushed out things like Trofim Lysenko's madness in in the USSR? I did, actually. Truth is, if you actually stick to the normative principles of science, you can actually get rid of the stuff that is driven by ideologues who are acting in the social context of their day. Science is not per Science itself is a process by which one gets at the truth. Scientists are flawed individuals, and you have to be really dedicated to that principle of disinterestedness. Um where you're after just whatever the truth is when you're doing your research, if you really want to to, um, to have it be truly good scientific research that you're doing um, and sort out the, the nonsense that there is. Anyway, let's see. We're going down here. As with any EDI activity, the support of senior leaders was essential for the project to be seen positively by the department. Yes, I've run across that too. Um, let's see. As the project developed, we decided to group together our decolonization efforts with F F efforts to diversify the curriculum. This encompasses expanding the curriculum to be inclusive and intersectional, for example, by including scientific work of individuals from a broad range of underrepresented backgrounds. We decided to include to work to include both strands of activity together, since we since this approach would be the most inclusive. Okay. Um, just a reminder, the word inclusive is drawn from the Latin includere, and its precise translation actually means to imprison or confine. Non sequitur, not, well, yeah, it's, it's not important to this discussion. It's just a little fun tidbit about the word inclusive um, and where it's actually roots and drawn from. Um, yeah, that's that's not important to this thing. What I, what I do find interesting is the... Let's see. How do I put this? The, the I'm all for including folks from different backgrounds in, in the, with a history class and what have you. I'm really actually all for that. That's not something I have a problem with at all. 
now that I think about it more carefully and what I exactly wanted to say. Um, the real question is, what are you going to do with respect to who, what has been traditionally taught and how are you going to characterize them going forward in your curriculum? <clears throat> Let's see. These are the initial activities we conducted to start decolonizing the University of Chemistry of New York chemistry curriculum. Fact finding and gathering best of best practice on what decolonizing curriculum means for a science department. Collection of examples of good practice from current lecture courses delivered to our department, compiled into a document, and circulated to all academic staff with encouragement to consider refreshing less lecture courses using similar concepts. Again, what about if it works? Because you've admitted you have nothing here to show that it actually works. You've not shown me anywhere that this is good and that should it be implemented because it is good because it did this, this, and this. You've not shown me any of that. And you've certainly not shown me this would improve the mastery of the students. In fact, the matter you've admitted you've had no evidence, you have no evidence of that. <clears throat> Compilation is set examples highlighting the work of black chemists. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's all well and good. Um, like I said, I don't have a problem necessarily with bringing up more of the history and who who did what from which continent and what have you. I actually don't have a problem with that. Um, I do have a problem if it descends into virtue signaling. You know, look how great we are that we're doing this. Um, that's just annoying and aggravating to me. Anyway, some specific examples of global chemistry have that have emerged through this exercise were the codification of early knowledge of papyrus produced by the ancient Egyptians which is discussed in the course on colloid chemistry that covered ap covered applications of micelles and gels in, for example, cleaning and lubrication. In a medicinal chemistry course, a global approach to the study of medicine is taken, highlighting the contributions from ancient China and India, India, the Arab world, and indigenous Aboriginal cultures. You know, I actually don't have a problem with that. But you've made my point here that I was trying to make earlier. Science isn't Western. Scientific practice isn't Western. There were a tremendous number of cultures that in the ancient world that developed the practice of science, um, the scientific process, the different components, and you've actually just shown that to me. And I think actually that whole paragraph after that, if I remember correctly, is the same thing. Yeah, where it's just showing the work of individual. I don't have a problem with that. Have those things. Talk about it. This is great. Would love to see more of that. But like I said, pair it with what is the Pair it with a course on what is the philosophical um, things of science and why they're important, the normative principles, the principles of scientific inquiry, all of that. And then, yeah, you got a deal that I would take tomorrow. History course, a history of science course that's on that, and a, a philosophy of science course that's on that, uh, that's on the that components of philosophy of science. Anyway. One of the other, one of the other areas of teaching in the department are, oh, wait a second. This, therefore, encourages students to think about the different contexts in which science can be applied and to reflect on the specific chemistries that may be needed to solve problems in the developing world. Again, I'm going to emphasize this. Yes, science can be used to do that. Is that the purpose of science is to solve problems in society? No, the purpose of science is to find the truth, the pursuit of the truth. Um... Other areas of teaching in the department that are particularly well suited to this globalized approach are atmospheric sciences and green and sustainable chemistry. Um, okay, so I want to make a point with this again that I've been harping on. Um, I have no problem with teaching all of this kind of stuff you're talking about with history. Absolutely no problem with that. I would leave it up to the individual professor in their course and whether or not they think it's relevant um, to do that. But I don't have a problem with that. Go for it. What I would do have a problem with and would ask, because they obviously haven't talked about it yet, is how are you characterizing, how are you asking professors to characterize um, European scientists, Western scientists, um, that have made great contributions also? You know, how are you asking for those country, uh, things to be done? Are you removing their names from it or changing the names of the dis discoveries that they did have? Um, all those kinds of things. And the other more, more interesting and more important question is how is this going to improve the mastery of the material that will make a good chemist um, here? You know, can, can you improve the ability of students to master chemistry? Um, that one, you just, you haven't proven to me any of that. Let's see. Is it possible to take a strategic approach to decolonizing chemistry? Uh, okay. One of the points that arise from our reflections on the decolonization work we've conducted to date 
is that there are a number of different approaches that could be taken to group together examples used for teaching material, and this goes significantly beyond the simple historic view of decolonizing the history of science. Simple his- I don't know what they mean. Let's see. Impacts of chemistry in different global contexts. Applications of chemistry can depend on where they are applied. Understanding the diversity of the global context better equips students to innovate in ways which will benefit different people across the world. Um, how's that better than working toward diversity of thought? Or is it the same? Could be the same. I'm just actually literally just asking a question. I'm not being not being denigrated, not not being critical of it at all. It's more so just asking a serious question here. You know how how is it? Uh, is it the same or is it different from diversity of thought? Because you know that's something that is important to me very much. So is the diversity of thought. Um, diverse histories in chemistry and science histories is focused on North, European and North American. Um. Why not have a history of science course? That's a required part of the major. You know? Why not have a history of chemistry course that's a required part of the major? Why not have a history of climate science course or something like that? Why not do that? That's a required part of the major. Like I said, do that and a scientific philosophy course. Have them both be parts of the major. That actually I would, I would think would be useful. Um, here and actually teaching what those are in terms of the traditional thing. Um, even a history of the scientific method course would be something that would be valuable. Let's see. Role model scientists from different backgrounds and cultures. The importance of role models is well established in STEM. Inclusion of such role models, either as educators or examples, can foster a sense of belonging among minoritized groups and encourage them to see what they to that they too can achieve success. Why do you have to have a role model that looks like you? Why do you have to have a... I, it strikes me as remarkably patronizing and condescending to have... To say that a student can learn better if they are learning from someone who looks exactly like them. Why not ingrain a culture... In which, yeah, you may not look like me, but I still see you as a role model because you're the chemist I know you can, I know I can be. I am the, you are the scientist that I know I can be. And, and in the, that sense, it would not matter what the person's culture is, where they grew up, where the background history is or anything like that, because you know what, I see you as a great scientist and I can be that too. And part of this is the human aspect of getting to know somebody who is not like yourself and being able to recognize, oh, they can keep that those other things about themselves as who they are and still be a great scientist. I want to be that. That's my role model. Why can't we have that? It always struck, it always struck me whenever I see the, the notion that Somebody learns better when they learn from somebody who looks like them or ha or comes from the same culture as them. Um, that doesn't necessarily make any sense to me. And it seems very patronizing and condescending, to be truthful. That's the whole thing, and that's my particular idea. <clears throat> science as a global endeavor. In much science education, to focus on inventor and lone genius, uh, well known to be somewhat of a myth. Can you provide the citation for that? I don't necessarily disagree, but I would love to see that actually cited where somebody showed that some that, that was a myth because you did have serious groups of people who worked pretty much alone when in the early history, at least in climate science, when the early history of climate science, we were still thinking that humanity couldn't have an influence on the climate. You did have people who worked pretty much by themselves often in jobs that were not anywhere related to climate science, and ended up proving some important findings that pushed us in the direction of recognizing, oh yeah, humans can actually um, influence the climate. But um, I've never seen that cited anywhere that there, I, I don't, I've never seen the citation for that, that's showing that that's a myth. Not saying it's not 
a myth, actually, and particularly in the last, you know, few decades, I would say that there's a lot of team driven. There's a lot of teamwork involved in doing science in particular, if you're in cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary um, research. Anyway, total other question. Total other thing. Uh, ethical considerations of applying science in a global society. The needs of different parts of the world are very different, yet science and its applications are largely, largely chosen by scientists and politicians in wealthier nations. Science is not chosen by anyone. Science is a process by which we find the truth. So, no, I don't agree with that characterization. If you're talking about which questions are largely considered by the larger community, then that might be more something you could you could you could argue. But no, not science itself. Let's see. Structures and hierarchies. The value of listening to diverse voices should be emphasized. I'm going to say I actually agree with that. I'll tell you why. Because diversity of thought matters to getting good science. You need to have a diversity of perspectives to be able to get at what? The truth, which is the purpose of the scientific process and the scientific method is the pursuit of the truth. Student voices and leadership. Um, key role in it is essential that the student voice is heard and fostered. This can be achieved academically and pastorally. Hmm. Uh, these videos... So she has, a, the, the authors have a bunch of videos um, that their students make. This challenges traditional structures and hierarchies in science and also centers the voices of concerns of minoritized, of individual students, many of whom are from minoritized groups. Let's see here. Uh, do, 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 by listening to one another. Okay. On that first part of it, students are students for a reason. They don't know too much about the world just yet. So having them lead is not necessarily a good thing, but being able to listen to them and make sure that their voices are heard is a good thing. It's two different things uh, here. And should make sure the voices of the students are heard. Um, pastorally? Why? This can be achieved academically and pastorally. Hold on. Definition of pastoral. Uh, related to, relating to the shepherd, devoted, based on, okay. I didn't catch yourself. Portraying. Okay, so lots of shepherds. So shepherding, I'm getting. Uh, pleasingly peaceful and innocent. Of or related to spiritual care or guidance, especially the congregation. Of or relating to... Okay. I don't think it is the job of the academic to give spiritual guidance. Maybe just me, but I don't think that is your job to give spiritual guidance. I'm going to take that. You mean that in the shepherding kind of sense of the word? Um, that you can shepherd students in that direction, which... Um, I don't think that's necessarily your job to shepherd students either. Your job is not to teach them what to think, but how to think, um, as part of your job there. Uh, by listening to one another talk about their own lived experiences and the need for work collectively in order to solve global environmental issues. Uh, you, you all know this if you watch this channel. I don't like the word lived experiences all that much because it is uh, redundant. Any experience, by definition, is lived. <laughs> Unless there's an unlived experience somewhere that I don't know about, every experience by definition is lived. That's a stupid, stupid phrase. I have not no love for that particular phrase. <clears throat> it's important to note that in taking an approach to decolonization, we are no way advocating the chemistry department should de-emphasize the key principles and theories of science. Obviously, these are vital. The scientific theories are not wrong, however... We are encouraging educators to reflect critically on the context in which they teach these principles and the applications with which they choose to exemplify them. You know, there's something interesting that wrong is in quotes. That hints again at a bit of a postmodernist uh, thought thinking here, which is, again, pretty much what this whole article is a little bit about. Um, because there is a lot of moral relativism in postmodernist thought and critical theory. There is no right, there is no wrong. Um, whereas in other approaches, there is a right and wrong. And with respect to a theory, a theory is wrong if it is proven to not reflect reality or you can't make a prediction off of it. Um, so yeah, theories can be wrong, actually. That is a uh, false statement there. There's not moral relativism associated with this. Let's see. <clears throat> Historically, been over. Okay, our approach to decolonization impacts all other aspects of D -E -D -D EDI, as it applies to other minorities groups such as women, LGBTQ plus communities, those with disabilities, many of whom have been historically overlooked, 
both in the history of science and also in the way that modern science seeks to apply its knowledge and methodology to solving world problems. Um, again, what's the purpose of science? The purpose of science is not to solve all the problems of the world. It is the pursuit of the truth. Not to say that that doesn't lead to solving all the world's problems. Well, not all the world's problems, but to solving problems. Um, but that's not the purpose of science. Sometimes in the pursuit of the truth, you end up finding and creating more problems. <laughs> because you realize something was wrong and you got to go back and fix whatever ended up being wrong. But that's a whole other thing. All right, the summary. We're here. We share this account of our decolonizing the curriculum work, very much aware that we have started a project that is certainly not yet finished. No proof it does anything good. You have no proof, and you've presented no proof to me that it does anything good. You've also presented no proof to me, now that I think about it, that uh, the objectivity in there is is uh, missing in this. I think I, I don't think you quite presented that, but I could be wrong. Uh, let's see. We are actively working towards decolonizing our student experience in other ways, including reaching out, uh, including carrying out a major study to fu funded by the Royal Society of Chemistry on the lived experience, on the experiences of our ethnic minority students. Let's see. We have demonstrated that a decolonized curriculum can be embraced as part of an inclusive and supportive undergraduate environment. Not really, because you haven't uh, you haven't demonstrated to me that it's good, that it's good, and that it was needed. I'm just making a point here. Student campaigners have been lobbying for change for years, advocating for more representative and supportive curricula to improve the trajectories of marginalized groups through through the academic pipeline. We hope that by sharing our progress at this point, we can inspire greater momentum toward a vibrant, decolonized, and diversified curriculum across the international chemistry community. Okay, so that's it. Um, funny enough, though, do you know what they never did? They never showed whether it's good. They never showed whether it'll improve the mastery of the students with respect to the basics of chemistry. They never showed whether it would improve anything with respect to what they showed there. In fact, they admitted they have no evidence for that. So do you get what the theme is for what I've been talking about in this video? You can always, always ask. Remember, remember that sometimes when you go further enough into a field or something gets incorporated into general knowledge, Citations end up disappearing. The authors assume here, is a, are assuming as a generality, hey, decolonization is good. How could it be bad? Um, decolonization is good, according to, to these authors. But yet they never proved it. Never demonstrated why it was good. Never demonstrated really why it was needed beyond, beyond showing me some disparities and saying that their students wanted it, which is fine. But they never showed it was good. Never showed it would improve mastery. Never showed it would even fix the problems that they're talking about with disparities at all. Which I, sus I suspect it won't because it's, it's certainly not just discrimination that causes those disparities. Um, here, so that would be the lesson I would take away from this article. Beware of the generalizations like that and always ask, can you improve it? How do you know this is good? How do you know this will be a good thing? Where is your evidence? As I said, science is about the pursuit of the truth. Science is a process in, for answering questions in pursuit of the truth. And it is very much an evidence-based thing per empiricism, which comes from, comes from the golden age of Islam, actually, where we get that critical component of physical sciences is the uh, golden age of Islam, where empiricism was first uh, created as a concept. And so there is all of that. So I would demand to know, with this, because it was never shown, it was never proven. What is your evidence that this is a good thing? Not that you think it could be a good thing, but is a good thing. That it will work to address, to reduce the disparities that you're talking about, and that it will improve the mastery of this mastery of chemistry material. Those are the two things that I would want to know, seeing something like this. And those are the two things you should ask if somebody's coming to you asking, about decolonizing curriculum or decolonizing something else. Can you prove this is really good? And I want to see your evidence. I don't want you to tell me you have evidence. I want to see it. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video, hit the like button on the way out the door, comment on the video, share the video, subscribe to the channel, all that lovely good jazz. 
And don't forget, of course, at 8 p.m. Central Time, exclusively for my local supporters, which you can see scrolling across the bottom of the screen right now, uh, we will be having a live chat on this particular video. So I hope you will, uh, particular video, this particular article, amongst other things and questions about how to deal with decolonization. So feel free to come on over and join us in Locals to chat about that. Um, until next time, I'm Adrian, and I hope you all stay curious, my friends.